Good evening. A special welcome to our guests and visitors and those who are joining us online. As we gather together, we hear from our Lord. And when we hear from our Lord, sometimes he flips things that we understand on its head. And one of those days is today, where we hear the things that are blessed are cursed and the curses are our blessings. As God's people, when we are connected to him, we are blessed in ways that the world can't even imagine. And how wonderful a blessing it is to be connected to our Lord through faith. So we ask our God to be with us today as we begin with our opening hymn. Please stand. We begin today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, you are the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, for it is evening, and the day is almost done. Let your light scatter the darkness. Let it shine in our hearts and lives. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, and in our deeds, and in all that we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver and restore us that we may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we have been bought back from sin, death, and hell by the perfect life and innocent death of Jesus Christ. In him we are forgiven. Let us rest in his peace until the rising of the sun when we shall serve him in newness of life. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God in mercy, 
receive the prayers of your people. Grant them the wisdom to know the things that please you and the grace and power always to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We join in reading the psalm of the day, Psalm 1. Blessed are they who hope, who hope in the Lord. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Blessed are they who hope, who hope in the Lord. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Blessed are they who hope, who hope in the Lord. Our first lesson is Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 5 to 8. This will also serve as our sermon text for today. You'll notice some elements that are very similar to our psalm, and maybe kind of pay attention to that. With the tree connected to the streams of water and having life, um, that is also played here in Jeremiah. A blessed life is not connected to outward circumstances like physical health or wealth. Rather, the one who is blessed is the one who has been given the gift of faith, whose trust is in the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in in man, who draws length from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wasteland. They will not be prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the streams. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. This is the word of the Lord. The second lesson is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 10. Paul had some infirmity he initially viewed as a weakness. He he came to see it as a blessing as it forced him to rely on God's strength. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weaknesses, so that Christ's power may dwell on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand out of respect for the gospel. The gospel is Luke chapter 6, verses 17 to 26. In one of his most famous sermons, Jesus teaches that the good things we seek are found in places we would least expect. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured and the people all tried to touch him 
because power was coming from him in healing them all. Look at his disciple, looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who, are hung, who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leave for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. This is the gospel of the Lord. We join in confessing our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Today we're going to do a little bit of shopping or at least browsing. The store that we're going into is a store like Hobby Lobby. We're going into this home decor place and probably some of you already are checking out and saying, I don't want to go in that store. I don't want to spend money in that place. But bear with me a little bit. We, we walk around and there's this one word that always seems to kind of stick out to me as my wife and I kind of look around. Sometimes it's on pictures, sometimes it's on mugs or things like that. What is that word? That word is blessed. And you might see this on, on these pictures and things like that, but every time I walk past it, uh, I, it makes me ask a few questions. I'm not saying anything is wrong with it. I, it, it just makes me think a little bit, probably more than it should. And, and so I, I start thinking, who would buy something like this? Why would they buy it? Well, what motivates them to want some kind of artwork like this? Is it because they, they, they like the simplicity of it? Is it because they, they think, because this is on my wall, I am now blessed? Or, or do they, does it help them think that they are blessed? Or maybe it helps some people think about Jesus and how he blesses them. I don't know. But it kind of gets my brain going, and it kind of just makes me think about it. But I, I kind of wonder, do, does the world really understand what blessed is? I, I think sometimes the world has this simplistic view of blessed. That if anything good comes my way, if it be good fortune or possessions, then I am blessed. But is that the way God views being blessed? Does God have the same kind of view of being blessed like the world does? And I think we might be surprised at what we see in here today, that God has a different definition when it comes to blessings and curses. And we might be surprised at what we hear. 
For the last couple of weeks, we have been going on a journey with Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. We, we have gone on a journey with Jesus and heard him preaching in the synagogues and teaching on the side of lakes. We've seen him healing people and catching a net full of fish. But now we're going to jump from the New Testament back to the Old Testament and go on a journey with one of God's prophets named Jeremiah. And our journey begins at the time of King Josiah. Jeremiah started his ministry under King Josiah, and Josiah is known as this God-fearing king, unlike those before him and sadly those after him. We hear a little bit about him in 2 Kings chapter 22. Josiah was eight years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed completely the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. You might kind of wonder, well, what changed this course? from all these ungodly kings to Josiah. Was there something special about him? Actually not. Well, what changes a person's heart? God's word. God's word changes people's hearts. And that was no different than King Josiah. We hear later on, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. And then after reading the law, he tells the priest and orders the priest this, Go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us because those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written there concerning us. Do you notice the change of heart? As Josiah read the book of the law, God's word, the law had an impact on his heart, making him realize his sinful nature and all the sins that he had done and all the sins that the kings before and the people before had done. And it led him to understand he needed mercy and grace from his Lord. Josiah was certainly blessed. When he turned back to the Lord, the Lord showed him mercy. But the thing is, certainly Josiah turned, and most likely many others, his people, but there were some who were kind of two-faced. They, they, they put on the face like they worshipped the Lord, but their hearts were far from him. They had turned away from him, and eventually Josiah dies and the people go back to their old habits, their old ways of worship, their old false gods, their unbelief. And now this is Jeremiah's ministry. He is encouraged to go out and preach to these people and to turn back to the Lord once again. But what does he tell them? This is God's word. I will destroy daughter Zion, so beautiful and delicate, Shepherds with their flocks will come against her. They will pitch their tents around her, each tending his own portion. Cut down the trees and build siege ramps against Jerusalem. The city must be punished. It is filled with oppression. As a well pours out its water, so she pours out her wickedness. Violence and destruction resound in her. Her sickness and wounds are ever before me. Take warning, Jerusalem, or I will turn away for you, from you and make your land desolate so no one can live in it. What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> do you think the Lord is serious? Do you think the Lord is going to destroy Jerusalem do you think he's going to destroy these unbelieving people? He does. He brings out his wrath upon them for their unbelief. 
he sends Babylon to Judah and destroys them and wipes them out. That's what sin deserves. The people were cursed for their unbelief. They're turning from God. Now we, we might kind of understand the history of, of Judah and where we're heading. But when Ju Jeremiah speaks today in our text, this is before Babylon has come. And that helps us kind of get a better understanding of what is coming and what Jeremiah is saying. The only one who could stop this from coming is the Lord, but he wasn't going to stop it unless the people turned back to him. So we might begin to start thinking, why isn't the people turning back to him? Why aren't they repenting and for, for asking for forgiveness? But I think it's not too hard for us to maybe imagine or comprehend some of the struggles that they probably were going through or the barriers that they put up. Well, when life is going well, where do people look? Often to themselves, often to their blessings or the things of this world or other people. And maybe even those Jerusalem and Judah people, God's people began to think, Life is good. This is because of our work. This is because of what we've done. These are our possessions. Life is good. Why do we even have to worry about anything? I, I, I remember this gentleman. I, I went to hang flyers and help out one of our Wells churches while I was at MLC, and it was in Nevada. And for some reason, he, he's stuck in my mind all these years and what he said. And I still think about it today. I, I, I don't think he was a Christian. I think he, he was probably agnostic or something like that. But he, he had this kind of phrase that he said to us as we were going to door hanging flyers and we stopped at his place and he said, said this. When things are going well, people look at their feet. When things go bad, they finally look up. And, and for some reason, I, I've thought about that. Even though this gentleman wasn't a Christian, it, it, I think there are some truths to that statement that he made. How often when things are going well, we, we just kind of look to ourselves and we're just like, this is comfortable, I am blessed, and this because I have my home, my family, my wealth, and, and what else it, it could be. It could be a variety of things. Yeah, but when trouble comes, when difficulty comes, then finally some people look up, but they often look in the wrong direction. They don't look to the true God. It, it is probably not a stretch to think these people that Jeremiah was proclaiming to had this kind of problem, of thinking their earthly blessings were a sign that things were going well and that they were heading in the right direction, that these false gods were worth worshiping and praising. Maybe even other nations looked around and thought, hey, these people are blessed. But were they really blessed? Well, listen to what Jeremiah proclaims. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in a wasteland. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. If anyone lives in unbelief, it doesn't matter how much they think they are blessed or how much bless earthly blessings they think they have. If they have turned away from the Lord, they are cursed. What does the, all this mean? Maybe we can understand it this way. The one who, who trusts in those things is not trusting in the Lord. And they may trust in those things and their lives may seem perfect from the outside. They may seem like they, they, they have wealth, they've got a nice home, they've got the nice hobbies, they, they've 
got the nice family, everything seems in order, but are, are, are those kinds of people, those unbelieving people, blessed? Well, when hardship comes, where do they turn? When someone dies, where is their comfort? Can these earthly possessions protect them? No. They, they may be able to put up walls and put up these barriers to uh, lessen the impact, but trouble is still going to come. The judgment will still come their way if they tur don't turn back to the Lord. They are cursed. Jeremiah compares the people, the unbelieving people, in this way. He, he talks about a bush. And a lot of people, a lot of scholars think this might be like a juniper bush. And maybe you could debate what kind of bush it is, so to speak. But uh, this one might be a good picture to use. The, the, the roots of this plant are, are shallow. And it's very fragile. Essentially, if you overwater it or underwater it, it is going to die. So now imagine this bush in the wilderness that Jeremiah describes in a desert. Imagine dirt that is rock hard and is cracking. This is the bush that is in this kind of land. And you could imagine the heat of the day bearing down on this delicate bush and it feels like you're in an oven. Is this bush going to survive? No, it's not. It is eventually going to die. It doesn't have the nutrients, it doesn't have the water, it doesn't have the environment for it to grow. It is cursed. It is going to die unless someone takes it out of that environment and gives it life. How often do we as people look at the sinful world and say, how blessed those people are. How blessed are those unbelieving people. You might even say... Uh, those unbelieving people are so blessed. It seems like their lives are perfect. It seems like they have all the things. When my life seems to be a struggle, when it seems to be a hardship, when I have health issues or money struggles or things like that, how can that be? Or maybe even you say, oh, those unbelieving people, it, it seems like their lives are so nice, they don't have any troubles, but my life is full of storms and trouble and droughts and hardship. It seems like they're the blessed ones. But remember, they are not with the Lord. Their faces are not tor turned toward Him. So they are not blessed. E even though they might have those earthly toys and things like that, that means nothing in the end. They, they don't have that eternal blessing. We need to be careful of this trap as well as many others. Maybe we begin to kind of think in our own minds when things are going well, I am the source of my happiness. I am the source of the blessings in my life. I can weather the storms by myself by the way I think or the things I let into my life, or the walls I put up with my money so that those things don't impact me like other people. But the storms, the droughts, and all of those things, if we are apart from God, will impact us in every single way. So how are you and I blessed? Well, it's as simple as trusting in the Lord. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. When we put our trust in God, we are blessed. You might still say, I don't feel blessed. 
I, I, I don't have the, the nice toys or the nice home or even a job. How am I blessed? I don't have the, the three-figure job like the atheist woman next door to me. And, and there's probably a wide range of examples that we can give. But again, when we are with the Lord, when our faith is in God, we have all the blessings that we could possibly ever need. But you still might ask, how am I blessed? Why am I blessed? You are blessed because of your God. You are blessed because of your Savior, Jesus. You are blessed because Jesus came into this sinful, barren, desert land that we call earth. He came into this world and walked amongst sinners, many of which had turned their faces away from him, even some of his own people. But he came into this world to take upon our curse. The curse that we all deserve. On the cross he bore our curse of eternal hell upon him. He bore the curse that we deserve as he was abandoned by his heavenly father. He endured the deserts of hell. He endured the pain and suffering that we deserve. For you. For me. So that we could be blessed through faith in him. You are blessed through faith in his life, his perfect life, his innocent death and resurrection. You are blessed. Jeremiah gives us this other picture that, that is really beautiful as a Christian, and it brings great comfort to us. Instead of a bush, we see a tree. Instead of a desert and wilderness, we see a stream and river. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes, it leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. You are this tree. You are this tree as a Christian. You are not planted in a desert or some kind of wilderness. Your roots go into the stream itself into the source of life where water continues to flow and will continue to flow to the end of time and it will not dry up. Your roots are in Scripture and God Himself. You will not wither away. Your leaves will always be green. How beautiful this is. How beautiful you are as a child of God. How excellent it is that our Savior gives us this kind of life. How blessed we are. Again, I'll say it again. How blessed you and I are because of Jesus. It, do you really understand the picture that's being kind of given here? Before we saw the, the bush that was going to die, but here is a tree and it doesn't matter if drought comes or any kind of famine or anything else. The, the tree isn't even going to acknowledge it. It's not even going to see it because it doesn't matter. It has life. It, the le leaves are always going to be dre green and it's always going to be producing fruit. You are this tree. So when you're connected to God, it doesn't matter the droughts or the troubles that come. You won't even look at it because it doesn't bother you. It's not going to dry out the leaves. It's not going to kill the fruit. It's not going to do anything. It continues to live. You continue to live as a Christian. Nothing in this world can phase us because of who we get our nourishment from. You are 
blessed. <laughs> and even if we don't have earthly blessings in the sense of those possessions or things that the world wants to acquire, we have the nourishment and blessings that we need for all eternity. And maybe we can understand this just a little bit better. Get into the life of Jeremiah. He was to proclaim uh, repentance for the people, to have God's people turn back to him, but they rejected him over and over again. Imagine the things that they did to him, the things that they said to him. But then God finally came to bring Babylon and bring the city of Jerusalem down. And Jeremiah was part of those people. He was part of that siege when the Babylonians came in and destroyed his hometown, his city. He, he was there when the, the army destroyed the place that he adored, the place where God was worshipped. He was there when his own people were killed and put to death by the Babylonians and the women were abused. He went through all of that. And then he was brought into exile into Babylon. Do you think he thought of these passages that he spoke to the people? Do you think God's people that were still around in Babylon thought about what Jeremiah said in our verses for today? Even though the storm came, even though the weather and the struggle came their way for, because of the unbelief of many people, Jeremiah, even though he had to go through all that as well, remembered God's blessings. Remembered the, the roots that were in the stream that is God himself. So even when Jeremiah went through those difficult times, he was blessed as one of God's people. And you are blessed too. You are blessed because of your faith that God has given to you. You are blessed because of your baptism. Your faith is blessed every time you partake in God's body and blood and you hear his word. You are blessed with the nourishment that continues to give you life. It doesn't matter what you have or don't have. It doesn't matter the job you have or the job you don't have. It doesn't matter the troubles that come your way or don't come your way. You have eternal blessings. Blessings that many people would right now rather in their minds not have. But we have to tell them that this is the blessing we all need. That we need to turn to the Lord, ask for forgiveness, and the Lord will give us that forgiveness. He will give us that life. You are blessed. You are not cursed by God's grace and mercy. You are blessed with life in heaven because of your God. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God of grace and truth, Please help us to not get caught up in all the earthly things. And please, Lord, help us not be focused on ourselves as the source of those things, but to trust in you that all things come from your grace and mercy, that we thank you for all the blessings that you give us in this life. But most importantly, thank you for the blessing of life eternal with you, that you have given us salvation, that you have given us exactly what we needed, the forgiveness of sins bought by the blood of our Savior, Jesus. Thank you for this. Help us to value this more than anything else. Help us to value you before all these earthly things that are in our lives. Help us to put you as number one. Amen. And we join to pray. 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and keep us. Amen. You may be seated. We conclude with the closing hymn. Special welcome to our guests and visitors today. Uh, there are several announcements. Uh, I'll start with a few of these other ones first. So Lent we, is coming up quickly in a couple of weeks here. On March 2nd, we will have Ash Wednesday service at 6.30 p.m. That week, we will also have our normal service on Thursday as well. So we'll have Wednesday and then our Thursday service as we normally would in our Sunday service. The week after that and following, our midweek Lenten services will be on Thursday and not Wednesday. Uh, we figure everybody's kind of meeting anyways on Thursday, and that way we just kind of keep it consistent and also that we just don't fill another uh, service because that would be essentially 
I'll, I'll be doing Ash Wednesday at St. Paul at, at 4 o'clock, and then here at 6.30, and then we'd have a Thursday, and then the two Sunday services, um, which would be quite a bit for the week. Um, so we're just trying to minimize some of that. Um, our Lenten rotation pastors is a changing this year. Um, we're connecting with a different part of our circuit, and so we'll have all new pastors um, that are coming uh, to our church that probably haven't been here in quite some time, or uh, even if ever, I'm not sure. Um, so it'll be a blessing to uh, sit and listen to them and, as they share God's word. Uh, there is an event that is coming up that is going to be hosted by Mount Olive in Appleton. I've been kind of keeping my eye on this program. I believe it's part of our synod, and it can be, uh, you can have them kind of come in-house. Uh, essentially, this is called an everyone outreach, and the the event is on February 26th and 27th, so a, a Saturday and a Sunday. And I'm looking for maybe one to four people who might be interested at least to join me on Saturday. Um, I am going to sign up and go to this. Uh, I heard one of the speakers at the conference this week, and they kind of spoke about. Uh, this gentleman kind of culture and I think culture is going to be a big part of kind of how we talk and how do we facilitate a good culture and get it moving um, th those are some of the things that he's going to talk about I believe at this uh, conference kind of thing the seminar on Saturday and Sunday so if you are interested and are available and would like to maybe drive down with me um, I, I would sign some of us up uh, I am maybe going to try to make it down for Sunday, but obviously it's going to be going to the service and, and then going down there. Um, so we'll kind of see if that works out and if I have the energy for it. Um, so we'll, we'll see. Uh, there is a game day coming up. St. Paul is wanting to do more with us as a church. And I think that is a, a, a thing that as people of Calvary, we need to really think about too. Our brothers and sisters are not too far, and we have a lot of family members that go to that church. And how do we in kind of incorporate all of us together? And so they are starting up kind of uh, an event that we're hoping to maybe continue on. It's a game, game day. They are going to provide lunch. And the date on here is incorrect. It is the 27th, not the 20th. So I will say that again. It would be on the 27th after church up at St. Paul. They would like to know who all would like to attend. So there is a sign-up sheet on kind of the podium thing on your way out. So even if you're not going to attend but are kind of thinking about it, they would like to have the numbers because they would rather, you know, try to order enough food for everybody but not too much. So if, if they would rather not order for 100 if they're going to only have 25. So if it's something that you are interested in doing, um, please sign up. And I think this is something that when we have maybe our picnic, if we have that again during the summer, um, we would in, maybe invite them to come down and say, hey, why don't you join our family and uh, all of that. One final kind of thing and kind of a, a, a thank you. So we were wanting to purchase a new piano, a new sound system, and then we had an oven go out at the parsonage. We had an anonymous donor from our congregation who donated for the piano, the sound system, and all new appliances at church. And we want to say thank you to them. Um, they, they certainly care about their church and wanting it to move forward and continuing to you know, serve God in all these new ways. And we already got the piano. Um, Elise, my wife, was able to play it on Sunday. And she had people that were coming up and saying thank you. Or just kind of not necessarily thank you, but how nice it was. Um, they really in enjoyed it. And so we are going to be using the piano on Sunday 
for one of our soloists and for our kids that are singing. We ordered the sound system already, and it could be here in two to three weeks, depending on how all that stuff goes. We already ordered some of the appliances for the parsonage. Um, so again, we, we thank them for that. And just how wonderful our church family is. That, you know, you have all of God's people that care for his church, care for his mission, and when you put these things before them and before their hearts, they are going to answer. And maybe we think about that tree. The tree that is connected to the water produces fruit. And, you know, you see, you know, maybe it's through these gifts. Maybe it's through encouragement. Through, maybe it's through prayer that God's people step up and do, you know, great things out of thanks for him. And, you know, what, what more can God's people do with God's help and blessing? Um, maybe there, there's a lot more in store for us. With that kind of being said, I think I was at this conference this last week, Dare to Lead. It was Monday and Tuesday, and I don't mean to go on further, but I, I think it's got some value. I, I, I took some cl kind of workshops on family. How do you reach out to the community? How do you care for new families? How do you change the, or build up the family environment in the church? You can kind of see where my heart and mind is when it comes to our church. It's family oriented. And I think that is a strength of ours because I've heard people come into our church and say, you know, essentially, uh, your church is warm and we appreciate, you know, how welcoming it is. And I think we need to use that to our advantage. And how do we build up that culture of where we care for one another and serve the Lord together? And maybe what are we kind of blinded to maybe when it comes to different kinds of cultural things that we might not be aware of? How do we build our church up and move forward? And essentially, you know, how, how do we care for each other as a family? And I, I think that is something that we really need to just think about. And how, how do we implement these things and make sure that this is happening at Calvary? Um, yeah, it's something that I'm going to be thinking about a lot as we move forward. Um, how do we care for those new people? How do we care for our current people, those that we see regularly and those that we haven't seen for a time? How, how do we care for the, the community and those that still need to hear this saving word, the, this blessing that is from our God? Um, that, that is on my heart, that is on my mind. And I, I really got a lot from the conference to just kind of think about and kind of ponder. And I hope to share some of this kind of information with you as we move forward. So uh, that's kind of all that I have for now as I kind of stop getting off. And uh, I hope you have a blessed uh, day in the Lord. And I uh, hope to see you next week.